Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. The tomb of Kenkawas may not be the most breathtaking ancient monument on the Giza Plateau, but this Old Kingdom ruin is certainly one of the most prominent. Today is very much unloved and the tomb is off limits to tourists, which for me is a real shame because I think it may still have a secret hiding in plain sight. For the first half of this video, I'll be taking a close look at the tomb of Kenkawas before highlighting a curious anomaly I've identified on the 2006 laser scanning survey results, which I think could be an entrance into a hidden chamber or corridor, unopened for four and a half thousand years. Although today it does look like a dilapidated ruined mess, there are signs that this structure would have been somewhat beautiful when first constructed. In fact, you can even argue there is more than one phase of construction. What we see today is a two-step tomb structure, and although it has been referred to as the Fourth Pyramid of Giza, I don't think that this was ever the case. It may have been the original plan, but it was never the final product. The lowermost step is a large outcrop of limestone bedrock. According to Egyptologist Miroslav Werner, this was the original 4th dynasty structure for Queen Kenkawas, daughter of King Menkore and wife of Shepseskaf and then Yusakaf. Werner says this simple one-step uncased bedrock tomb was decorated on all sides with a palace facade style of decoration, remnants of which can still be seen on the south side today. And although yes, there is certainly clear visual evidence of the palace facade decoration, it's not seen on every side, and it is an assumption that the first phase is 4th dynasty. All we really know for sure is that before it became a two-step structure, cased in fine Chura limestone, it did have an earlier incarnation. More on this later in the video. Werner says the second tier was added in the first half of the 5th dynasty, when the tomb was reconstructed, altered and entirely cased in fine Chura limestone. I would argue that all of this work coincides with when the structure first became the tomb of the queen, i.e. an older structure was repurposed for her. The second tier 7 core superstructure on top is made entirely out of masonry and was not positioned centrally on top of the structure and that's because of the weight of the stone, the poor quality limestone bedrock below and the position of the chambers. The bedrock limestone already had a number of natural fissures, the limestone was relatively weak and so I assume the architect of the second phase of work realised this and couldn't risk extra stress on the roof of the internal chambers, which could have effectively collapsed. The fact the top tier is not central on the structure pretty much proves that this was never a true pyramid, and also that there are no chambers to be found on the western side of the structure. Although there are a handful of pictures available, some amateur video footage, sections in books and a few old papers, as well as a fantastic layman's guide by Keith Hamilton, there really is a shocking lack of official detailed information and scale diagrams for this prominent Giza landmark. Selim Hassan's work at Giza was of course groundbreaking, but his information on the tomb of Kenkawas is somewhat lacking. For the main basal pedestal structure, the one made from the bedrock, he says it's 45.5 meters long by 46.5 meters wide by 10 meters in height, although this is likely an estimate when cased with Chura limestone, which we know it was. Without the casing, the structure was anything up to 1 to 2 meters shorter north to south and east to west. Thinking in cubits, it was probably planned to be 88 cubits square, which, as Keith Hamilton says, is one fifth of Khufu's pyramid side length. As pictures show, a substantial amount of limestone bedrock is missing in the southeastern corner, roughly 11 metres on the east side, 
8 meters on the southern side and up to a height of around 10 meters. Meaning there is something like 900 cubic meters of rock missing from the corner of the structure. Why it's missing we don't know, but several large masonry blocks are still visible in this corner. So it looks like it was certainly built back up. Maybe there was a natural weathered void in the limestone, and this made it structurally unsound, and so the corner was removed. But I think it's possible the rock was already gone, long before the second phase of work even began, either quarried or eroded away, way before the decision was made to turn the mass of limestone bedrock into a tomb for the Queen. It's also possible that at the end of the 4th dynasty and beginning of the 5th, the bedrock mass we call the Tomb of Kenkawas wasn't even separated from the large outcrop to the north, and it was just another rock-cut tomb dug into the limestone, albeit with the palace facade decoration running along the southern side. Whatever its true history, a grand tomb was certainly planned for the Queen. Being the daughter of King Menkore and the wife of Shepseskaf and then Yusakaf, the latter being the founder of the 5th dynasty, Queen Kenkawas was a very important figure and due to the titles displayed on the granite doorway, not to mention the fact she has given a false beard, vulture diadem and scepter in a depiction, she may have ruled Egypt in her own right at the end of the 4th dynasty, the sole ruler of Egypt. Yusakaf is thought to be a descendant of Khufu's son Jedefere, and also the high priest of the sun god Ra at Heliopolis. Whether she was forced to marry him for political reasons, maybe to keep power we don't know, but the union between King Kawas and Yusakaf would have brought together the sun cult of Heliopolis and the kingship of Egypt, and hence why we see a new era of royal sun worship with the birth of the 5th dynasty. There are many hypotheses around her role at the end of the 4th dynasty and beginning of the 5th, and there is no doubt she played a central part, and that is probably why we have such a grand tomb on the Giza Plateau, to honour such an important figure in the transition between the 4th and 5th dynasties, and why she had her own thriving court well into the 6th. The architect in charge of the site development probably wanted a perfect pyramid for the Queen like her ancestors before her, but for the structural reasons mentioned, her tomb ended up having this strange appearance. Despite that, it was finished and cased, did have a perimeter wall around it, and a mud brick settlement was built to the east, connecting the tomb of King Kawas and her court with her father Menkore's valley temple. It is believed that this town was occupied until the end of the 6th dynasty. Where we see the missing bedrock in the southeastern corner, there was a huge gateway made of pink granite bearing the name and titles of Kenkawas. This was the way inside, and on entering, the first room is known as the antechamber, or outer chapel, a small room rectangular in shape and made entirely out of masonry. To the west there is a second chamber with a higher floor level, and this was excavated out of the bedrock. This could have been subdivided into smaller rooms, or it could have possibly been a statue chamber. A wall was likely built all the way across as shown here, and the doorway was likely in the northwestern corner. From the antechamber you can also head north into the inner chapel. It was cut from the bedrock, but the walls were lined with fine Chura limestone, and floor slabs and ceiling beams were also added, giving this room a fantastic clean finish, quite the opposite to what we see today. On the western wall, there were a pair of false doors made of pink granite, and below the one towards the northern end, we find a descending passage that leads down to the underground part of the tomb. There we find six small storerooms and the burial chamber, which also had a pair of false doors. Egyptologist Selim Hassan did find fragments of an alabaster sarcophagus, but no traces of the queen herself. 
Now, I have to say, there are so many ideas surrounding not just the role of the Queen in history, but also the history and development of this structure. There is a good argument for it having an early dynastic origin, and that its first phase was actually much older than its final incarnation. However old this structure was, which will be the subject of a forthcoming video, it was turned into a square-shaped crude pyramid-like tomb for Queen Kenkawas sometime in the late 4th or early 5th dynasty. Before that, it's possible that the area that would become the antechamber was in the open air, and the inner chapel was maybe an old tomb but I suspect the deeper burial chamber was dug in the second phase, due to the similarities to the internal chambers in Menkore's pyramid. There are so many ifs, buts and maybes, but that's the nature in trying to understand ancient Egyptian architecture, especially with no quality written records and centuries of plunder, exploration and neglect. To summarise, in my opinion, the late 4th or early 5th dynasty architects decided to isolate a section of bedrock for the tomb of the Queen, so she could have her own pyramid close to her father's. The southern end of this massive limestone was already embellished with a palace facade decoration from earlier times, how much earlier we don't know, and I do think the southeastern corner was always missing. To some extent the inner chapel was already dug, and it could have been a pre-existing tomb, maybe now empty and already plundered. The bedrock was cut on the northern and eastern sides to isolate the square section, the inner chapel was expanded and renovated, and then workers dug down to make a new large burial chamber for the Queen. But noting just how defective the rock was, it was decided that the roof of the chambers could not support the weight of additional masonry above. The southeastern corner was built up to create the antechamber, and a small masonry second step was added on top, maybe in the same form of the mastaba of her first husband Shepses Calf. This addition would elevate the structure above those around it, make it more of a beacon in the landscape, and hence a tomb fit for the Queen. Once the masonry was added to the southeastern corner and on top, the structure was entirely cased in fine Chura limestone, and some of the blocks still remain today. So that is an extremely brief overview of this structure in my opinion, as well as the person it was built for. I've left some good links for those that want to get more detail, and if you wish to form your own opinion. So, that was the background, and for the rest of this video, I'm going to discuss something I've noted, an anomaly that could conceal a possible hidden passageway inside the tomb. Something I have been considering for a couple of years, after taking a close look at the laser scanning survey results from 2006. Ever since I first saw this robber's tunnel in the recessed northern wall of the inner chapel, and also this strange bank of rock with a post hole bored into it, I've been drawn to this part of the tomb. The recess on the northern wall is not well defined, and it's not even straight. As we can see, a large crack runs down the limestone, and this forms the eastern edge of the crude tunnel, a tunnel that Hawass and Lena say is 3.24 metres in depth. The recess stops around 60 centimetres from the ceiling, and is 72 centimetres in depth. Mark Lena and Zahi Hawass speculate that this recess was to hold a third and now missing false door, and the strange bank of rock that was left on the floor may have been connected with the placement of this third false door. But sadly, although they may be correct, there is no evidence of a third false door, and so it's also possible the reason we have a recess is just because of how the internal casing stones were added. These parts did not need to be cut away, as they would never be seen after the room was cased. It's estimated the wall casing would be around a cubit in thickness, and, as shown on this diagram, you can see how the uncut rock would be hidden from view. It is hard to visualise because the room is such a mess today, and it's also hard to view the recess on a plan diagram, as the edges are not straight and well defined. 
Some say this crude tunnel was made by the builders to test the durability of the bedrock because of the enormous fissure. But in my opinion, that doesn't make much sense. The large natural fissure is floor to ceiling and would have continued on through the inner chapel. The builders would have been well aware of it and so there is no need to create a proofing hole at this location. Unless of course the inner chapel was already there from the first phase and so further exploration of the rock's quality was deemed to be necessary. Either way, the best explanation is that this is a robber's tunnel or even a later intrusive burial. Now to the bank of rock. It's just north of the cutting in the floor that opens up to the sloping passage. The bank is 25 centimeters high and 2.18 meters in length. But what is it and why does it have a post hole? Regarding the hole, maybe a wooden post was inserted, maybe some kind of mechanism or winch to help move heavy objects into the inner chapel and then down into the burial chamber. Alternatively, maybe this hole was made by the robbers and an A-frame was anchored into it so they could remove items from the burial chamber. And although that could explain the hole in the floor, it doesn't explain the long bank of rock. It was left sticking up by 25 centimeters. It is well defined and so it was clearly intentional. It's estimated the original limestone floor slabs were 45 centimeters thick, which means once the tomb was finished, the bank of rock would not have been seen. It would have been concealed. Only by tearing up the pavement would this strange bank of rock come into view. So again, why is it there? Whenever I see a crude robber's tunnel, I always wonder why. Why did they dig in that specific location? What led them to excavate? What did they see? The northern wall was likely covered with fine Chura limestone and the bank of limestone would have been concealed under the floor. Of course, the entrance to the burial chamber may well have been concealed under the pavement as well and the robbers could have been looking for it, starting in the wrong place and digging northward instead of down and westward. Whatever happened, we do need answers, and this is where the 2006 laser scanning results come in useful. Nearly two decades ago, Egyptologists wanted a detailed 3D image of the tomb, rather than always relying on line drawings. The work was completed, and although no interactive 3D model was ever been made, as confirmed in an email from Mark Lehner last week, we do have this, an orthophotographic plan of the tomb, showing a detailed image of the entire structure, and we can also see the exact layout of the chambers within. Then there is this, a detailed plan of the interior recorded by the Regal LPM25HA middle range laser scanner. You can see the extent of the pit before entering the burial chamber, as well as the granite lined walls of the corridor heading west. The bank of rock is clearly defined. We can see the recessed northern wall and also the robber's tunnel. Although the data is in black and white, the detail is superb and it does match up pretty well with earlier scale drawings. This is a large natural fissure in the bedrock, today filled with litter, sand and rubble and here is a granite fragment that's thought to be from one of the false doors. You can see more individual details on this diagram than you can see with your own eyes today and that's because of the accumulation of sand, litter, dust and debris that has blown through the iron gates and now covers the floor. Even comparing two pictures of the bank of rock, one taken in 2018 and one from 2022 and you can see that dust and sand has almost filled in and covered over one crack in the floor. Recent video footage posted on YouTube from inside shows that clear and relatively deep footprints are left on the floor surface, meaning that any decent photographs or video won't show up the finer details identified on the laser scan images. And that really is a real shame. 
back in 2006 when the interior was laser scanned, I assumed that the tomb would have been cleaned up as much as possible before undertaking such a precise survey. And even if not, there would have been far less dust, sand and debris compared to what we see today, because the structure has been pretty much neglected by authorities ever since, and so much has blown in. These scans are pretty much the best and most detailed view we have inside the structure. Besides this, the only available photos and video come from Mark Lehner and the AERA from 2018, the ACEDA project from 2019 and 2020, and I've also received pictures and video from other sources that date to 2021 and 2022. There are plenty of images and video of the exterior pre-2018, but nothing from the interior, except for the laser scans from 2006. So, after finding a copy of the scans in high resolution, I looked over them for anomalies. Pretty much everything was as predicted based on earlier descriptions and diagrams. But amazingly, there is an anomaly at the northern end of the inner chapel, the area I wanted to know more about, and it does concern the strange bank of rock and the tunnel. Here I've highlighted the bank of rock, but what else do you see? There is a clear triangular shape, starting with the bank of rock, which forms the southern edge, and it ends inside the crude tunnel. I then looked at the laser scan diagram of the entire structure, where the experts have overlaid the internal diagram but in colour, and again you can clearly see this triangular feature. Interestingly, the width of the opening of the robber's tunnel is exactly the width of the triangular feature at this point, meaning that this feature looks to have dictated the tunnel's width. Next I looked at all the photographs and video I could find, but as stated they are only from 2018 onwards, and they really are few and far between. Sadly, the sand and dust buildup is just too great. We can just about make out a few of the fissures in this area, but unless someone goes in with a leaf blower or a broom, I don't think we can see anything conclusive. I've spent a long time looking at the pictures and video of this area, and it is hard to see anything meaningful. But I would love to hear what the experts think of this feature, how they read the data, and so I've emailed Mark Lehner and also Yuki Kawai, and I do hope I hear back. Laser scanning techniques can pick up even fine cracks in rocks and concrete, and so if the area was cleaned up before scanning commenced, then this triangular shape must be a feature of the rock. Due to its regular shape, and because the bank of rock forms one edge of it, I wonder if this is not actually part of the bedrock, but is actually a cover stone, and the bank of rock is how it was manoeuvred into position, slid in from north to south. I don't know how else to interpret what I'm seeing, the regularity of the shape, the fact it incorporates the long bank of rock, and the fact that the width of the opening of the robber's tunnel is exactly the same width of the triangular feature at this point. Are these all coincidences? And, just as I'm close to finishing making this video, I've just noticed something else. The length of the bank of rock is exactly the same as the width of the descending passage that heads off to the west, including the granite lining on the sides. So again, this makes me think a cover stone has been added to the bedrock, and at the very least, work had begun to dig a northern descending passage from the pit in the floor in the inner chapel, so there was one heading west and one heading north. Of course I have wondered if the shape I've outlined could be some kind of noise from the equipment, an artefact of the scanning technique. But this would seem strange, as the team of researchers did say they paid close attention to the northern end of the inner chapel, and when releasing the results, any noise or artefacts would surely have been removed, and the images cleaned up accordingly. We also don't see any other specific anomalies like this anywhere else. 
The triangular feature has also been kept when creating the superimposed orthophotographic plan of the tomb. Surely it must be an architectural feature, and if so, well, I think it could be the outline of a cover stone. It does explain the strange bank of rock, and also why we have a robber's tunnel. In my opinion, when the robbers were taking away either the casing stones or the false door from the northern wall of the inner chapel, as well as the floor slabs, they noted not just the bank of rock, but these lines in the floor that incorporated it. These lines were converging behind the northern wall, and so this probably led to the excavation of the tunnel. Of course nothing was found inside the tunnel, and that's because excavation should have been downwards, and not horizontally into the wall. When the entrance to the burial chamber was discovered, this work on the northern wall was probably abandoned, and the cover stone has remained in place ever since. So, this means that if this is a cover stone, it has never been removed, not in antiquity by tomb robbers, and not in the modern era by archaeologists. And so, who knows what it could be hiding. Because the length of the bank of rock matches the width of the western descending passage, maybe there is another corridor heading off to the north. Maybe as part of the early dynastic phase 1 tomb, or maybe as part of the queen's tomb. Of course the other option is it's covering nothing at all. The bedrock in this area is extremely defective, and here I've marked the abundance of natural cracks and fissures. It's possible that when this was being converted into the tomb of Queen Kenkawas, the builders did wish to dig down in a northerly direction first of all, but if the bedrock was too defective, they may have had a change of plan, and then just covered up the excavation with a slab of rock. I can only speculate as to what I'm looking at, but I think the information in this video does warrant a closer look, and it would be so easy to get some clarification. All we need to do is sweep away the dust, sand and debris, and then the outline of the triangular feature can be traced and documented. If the features are clear to see, and if they don't look to be natural fissures, geophysical techniques can tell us if there is a room or corridor at depth. If all of this is confirmed, well, Removing the cover stone would surely not be a major problem, because for nearly two decades and even longer, this tomb has been completely neglected. It's full of rubbish, and the iron gates mean it's not open to the public. Removing one stone slab couldn't make the inside any worse, as it is clearly a structure unloved and not cared for. So, for now, that's as far as I can take it. At best we're looking at the entrance into a hidden passage, unopened by tomb robbers, and hence untouched for four and a half thousand years. At worst we're looking at some natural geological features of the bedrock, and nature can form some regular shapes. And all we need to take this further is a simple broom or a leaf blower. And if the authorities give me permission, I'll happily fly over next week, get my hands dirty and do it myself. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.